Welcome to another edition of Bucknell Football 93. My name is Bob Beeler, along with the head coach of the Bucknell Bison, Lou Maranzan. And this past week, it was Dartmouth 31, Bucknell 13. But, Coach, as we were talking before rolling tape here, if you plays go one way or another, that game is a lot closer or possibly even a Bucknell victory on yeah, Saturday. Yeah, it certainly is. If you, you like telling stories and you look at our highlights, you certainly, certainly can see a lot of places where, uh, you know, one play here and there makes the difference in terms of the, the complexion in halftime, the complexion in the third quarter, and, and certainly the final score. Turnovers have been a factor all season long. It seems like not only at the wrong times, but in the wrong places on the field. Right, and in this case, the turnovers were, first of all, give them a little spot. Uh, first turnover turned into three points. Uh, that was an interception, and the second one was a fumble right down on our goal line, which was in one play converted into what now amounted to 10. And then there's some untimely mm -hmm. things also where we start to get something going, we give them the ball back. Uh, so it's a kind of a combination. Defensively, Jay Fiedler, at least passing, I didn't think was the factor that uh, he has been in the past against us. I think Jay Fiedler is a good player. Mm -hmm. uh, he made key plays when he needed to make them during the game. When they, particularly in the third quarter, were were trying to to, to kind of push away from us at that point, he made two great scrambles, which we'll see in a second. And um, he's a good player. Let's go now to the videotape and take a look at first half highlights from Christy Matheson Stadium. It was a beautiful day for football. Almost 8,000, biggest crowd of the season. Dartmouth would get the ball first, and Mark Miller, a cornerback, is going to make a whale of a defensive play. What's the key to making this play, Lou? Well, Mark's got good control. He's got, uh, he's over his, uh, you could say, over the top, and he just stays with him, and he uh, concentrates right to the end and just knocks it away. We talk about breaks for Dartmouth. Here's number one. Cops ball floats a little bit. Brian White comes up with the interception. They are stopped at the 29-yard uh, line there on the return. On a third and one, they go for the whole ball of wax. It's incomplete, and your defense has to feel pretty good, Coach, uh, limiting them only to a field goal. Yeah, stage. we forced them to come out with three. Had a real good play by uh, Ed Jackson out there on the cage in the, uh, the quarterback, and uh, they come up with just three. Defensively, that has to be a huge lift. Uh, you come up with the big third down stop, and they take it. Uh, I think you have to be feeling pretty good at this stage. Well, defensively, game. you know, you got to... You got to have some uh, some rubber band kind of people that are, that are willing to bounce up every time something seems to bounce the wrong way, and uh, I think we're learning that a little bit at a time. I've certainly been practicing it because we've had some bounces that we've had to react to, and uh, so uh, yeah, sure, we feel good when you can limit them to three points when they get the ball in close. Speaking of bad bounces, we'll take a look now at the ensuing kickoff, and this may have been one of the worst bounces of the day for Bucknell. Uh, Brad Bernardini, normally very sure-handed, has trouble grabbing it. And I don't think he ever really put it away. Well, yeah, he, he's got the ball, and they, they give him a good pop, and it comes out of there, and now they get the ball down the five-yard line. And then Jay Fiedler is going to go for a timing pattern in the corner to uh, John Highland, and in about a minute and 30, they've scored 10 points, and that's when we're talking about spotting in the lead. All right, it's a good quick throw and turn out, and uh, they're on the board now, and they've got their 10-point uh, advantage. Great drive here. Cop on the roll. Hits Mark Gentile, who would be the leading receiver on the day with five catches for 74 yards. Cop himself was a little bit off, but on this drive, he was pretty good. Brad Bernardini got his bell rung that time. He was a sandwich between two Dartmouth defenders, but he's going to come back and uh, come up with a touchdown. Here, Mark Gentile bails you out of a big third down play, and that sets up the touch. It's a real good throw by Travis there under pressure, and good catch by Mark. And here, a little swing pass, and you get Brad out on the open. Just a little bit of a crack, and he's gone. Yeah, exactly. Got some good blocks. That's a screen play, and uh, Brad accelerates and shows some of the, the quickness that he has. Momentum switched so many times in this football game, and it switches on the uh, long pass there to Bernardini. And right here, Mark Miller with an interception is first to two. Momentum is certainly in our favor now. And we just scored, and they come right back. We intercept right away. Tough play here, third and one. Not much line surge. Rich Lemon can't get it. Question here I wanted to ask. Did you think about calling timeout to set up a field goal? We, uh, at this point, uh, we... We figured that uh, you know we had a chance for the field goal going into the wind. Uh, we did not know how close we were to in on mm -hmm. time, so we didn't get an opportunity to call mm -hmm. the timeout there. And then obviously you decided to go for it, and uh, both teams had trouble with fourth down plays. When we turned around going into the wind, we felt like uh, we had a good play. We could get uh, three yards on the sprint out pass, and uh, their defensive end did an outstanding job, kind of the way Eddie did on the. Mm -hmm on the play that we pointed out before of, of theirs, and uh, we don't get the first down there. It seemed to me that a lot of balls were knocked down. Was the Dartmouth defensive line doing a lot of things to bat them down? Well, you know, they're, they're trying to do that all the time. You know, the defensive lineman wants to be a pass rusher, get upfield, and get a sack, but there are times that he gets uh, in behind a block, and he's got to be an obstruction guy, and uh, our guys are doing better and better at that. 
take a look at the conclusion of highlights in the uh, first half. Uh, we're going to see a good defensive play here. Everybody in the kitchen sink going at Fiedler. One later would cause a touchdown. This one is just going to be a sack. Cecil, Ed Jackson, Dave Strickland, they all get there. We got two good outside rushes there with uh, the, the ends coming around the, uh, the tackles who are blocking them. Bucknell down 10-7 here midway through the second quarter. This is a huge pass over the middle to Highland. It's going to set up a run for Umshide and get him a nice little 10-point cushion instead of a three-point cushion at the intermission. All right, that was a good play. And if you, you look to see where that ball went, that went like just right in between two backers. It was a good throw and a good catch. They carry it over from the two, 17-7 at this stage of the game, considering you've had three first-half turnovers. You're still in position. All right, we're still playing from uh, trying to get back out of that uh, that early stuff that happened, and uh, there's no doubt in our minds we've moved the ball, we've scored, uh, that that we can come back and do it. Uh, it's just a matter now of combining, you know, defense at the right times and also being able to get back up and get the ball and, and score. Seems to me that it's been frustrating for the team that we've had trouble starting in games, and once again we had trouble on Saturday. Right, we we've made. When you say trouble starting, you can talk about it a few ways. Uh, we've come ready to play, and we've played hard. Uh, we've made some errors mm -hmm. at the beginning of games, uh, the, uh, and that is very frustrating because obviously you're, you're working to get over the top of what, what you did wrong at the beginning. Uh, to our guys' credit is that they have fought back, and they've played some great uh, ball after making those spots. It's just that in the, the length of the football game, we're still not getting a consistency of uh, offensive performance that we need to get and uh, we're working to find that right now. In order to have a successful football team you have to recruit top-notch student athletes. Today on our feature Brad Herlock takes a look at the hard work that brings a student athlete to Bucknell. First and ten now at the Holy Cross 21. Four man front for the cross, one back, four receivers for Bucknell. Hardeville back to pass, throwing left side, end zone, touchdown Whitey Berardinelli. And with 628 to the gridiron. The place where many high school students aspire to compete when they leave home to go to college. But how does one get to play college football? The answer? Recruitment. Today we're going to take a look at the recruiting process. What's involved, how it's done, and most importantly, what recruiters are looking for. Recruiting begins in May of a high school student's junior year. High school students and coaches alike send letters and game tapes to various colleges hoping to attract the eye of a recruiter. Coach Gene DePew, recruiting coordinator for Bucknell, is one of these individuals. He receives tapes in the mail every day from high school students all across the country. I asked the coach what sort of things he looks for when watching a tape. The tape we look for to try to determine his athletic ability. Uh, for skill position areas, we try to get some kind of reading on his speed and, and uh, uh, coordination, hand-eye, and, and those kind of things. Uh, for a lineman, uh, we look for uh, strength and uh, foot agility and uh, uh, basically uh, for everyone try to evaluate uh, uh, how hard they play the game and kind of uh, get a feel for, you know, for that part of it as well. After watching countless hours of videotape, the coaching staff meets to decide who they should recruit. Many invitations are sent out to prospective students who may fit the mold of Bucknell football. I asked Coach Dick Riley what happens during a student's visit to Bucknell. Official visit, you hope his parents come. That's a weekend here on campus, which is for him to really spend time with our players. Um, it's not the time for us to constantly talk to him, but for him to get here and spend time with our players, talk to them, get the real scoop. Uh, in the dorms, meet our, meet our student body, meet as many faculty members as you can. Um, and if the parents are here, we more entertain them, bring them to dinner here on campus and do a basketball game which always is a tremendous uh, positive thing for us. Uh, and then after that, when he leaves, now comes the really hard part, because now you have to follow through and say, how do you like it? What do you think? You know. I asked him how involved parents are in the recruiting process. I find most of the time that most parents now are, are really interested and want to be in involved in the process, but are not going to make the decision for the young man, which is, I think makes it easier for us as recruiters. Because the young man is going to say, this is what I think, and you know, sit down with his parents, say, this is what I think, what's your input, this is what I like. And certainly that's a lot better than the parents saying you, you go there. Later in the day, I spoke with freshmen Jeff Fisher and Jim Fox. I asked them what recruiting was like from their perspective. Uh, Dick Riley from the Bucknell staff um, came to my school and I came out of one of my classes and he approached me in one of my rooms and talked to me about Bucknell and the football program. 
first they received a lot of letters and sent back questionnaires to the schools. Then they asked for tapes, and you sent tapes out. And then you, uh, then they contacted you for visits, and then you went on visits, and then you decided by your visits what you wanted to do. You Finally, I asked Coach DePew what he feels is Bucknell's strongest selling point to a high school student. Well, I think each, each person is a little different and looks for a little something different. Uh, uh, we just try to uh, try to be honest in, in presenting what we have to offer, and uh, that has to, you know, kind of be the right fit for the person uh, that, that we recruit. Uh, they have to be looking for the, you know, the kind of things that we have here, the, you know, the, the small school atmosphere and, and uh, the combination of of uh, academics and athletics that we offer, it, it, you know, it has to strike the person just right. Matching the needs of the ideal Bucknell football player and student is what recruiting is all about. For Bucknell Football 93, I'm Brent Herlock. Thanks a lot, Brent. And Coach, recruiting, I know you guys spend an awful lot of time, and I once remarked to somebody that if I somehow was made a coach the next day, I would prefer to be the outstanding recruiter than the outstanding coach because I think you have to have personnel. You can hire somebody like you to help me out and call the shots, but uh, you got to have the people on the field to win. As you know, in your in your business, uh, everything begins with sales, and mm -hmm. uh, in a way, recruiting is a sales business. And what we're selling is we're selling a great education in a in a great school, and in our case, a chance to be a pioneer in rebuilding a you know a long uh, football tradition. And you know, we it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and uh, but the results are ultimately having. Young, good young men come to a great school, so we, you know, it's, it's all worth it. Is recruiting fun? Is it fun going out and meeting people, meeting the families? I think it would be. Yeah, you gotta, you have to have the right attitude. I think if you're going to be a football coach, you better enjoy recruiting because you're going to have to uh, do enough of it, and you have to enjoy that interaction. And we certainly do. I think there's some football coaches along the way that that kind of grumble a little bit and say, well, maybe this wouldn't be a bad job if you just didn't have to do that stuff. But mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. It's good people. Before we get to the second half highlights, uh, you made a change at quarterback to start the second half. What went through your mind in the locker room when you made that choice? Well, uh, you know, we've got a couple quarterbacks, and they're both pretty good players, and uh, we're looking for uh, trying to create a certain chemistry, and uh, Travis has been working and improving, and uh, it's just a matter of giving Rob an opportunity to see what he can do in terms of seeing if we could kind of uh, get a little spark going, and that's really pretty much it. Well, Rob Gluss did get a little spark going. Let's take a look at highlights from the second half. The Bison uh, would uh, receive as the second half would uh, begin. Rob Gluss in there at quarterback. He went a, a 10 of 18 for 111 yards. It just looked like there was some spark. There was some spark in the receivers. He goes to Brad here. I thought the lineman fired off the ball a little bit better in his first drive. Well, I, I hope coming out of the, the second, in the beginning of the second half, down, you know, 10 points, you better come back out with some spark one way or the other. And I think it's a little bit coming from everybody. Russ here hands off to Craig Spencer. Nice run, huge hole over the right side. And right here we talk about turning points. Bucknell driving, could possibly get it to 17-14, but Hunter Buckner's going to come up with an interception. It looked like to me he didn't really look off uh, the receiver for Putnick there at all that time. Yeah, the kid makes a good break, and uh, we put the ball out there where he has a chance to get it. And then one play, looks like you were in a blitz here, which you have man-to-man -man coverage for the touch? Uh, yeah, this was a, uh, a man coverage, and they, uh, they beat the strong safety here, and he makes a good catch, and the receiver does a good job running away from him laterally, too. Mm -hmm. It was a nice play, and of course, Fiedler, you mentioned last week on the show that he throws the deep ball well, and that was one of the times he really showed it. He made three or four key plays in the football game that, uh, that just finished some things and sealed some things that need to be done, and that's, that's the kind of player he is. Was that the play you think that put them over the top? I think that was a big play, certainly, because we're struggling to, to make up a 10-point deficit, and uh, now they, you know, they, they break back right away and get a few more points, and uh, it's, uh, it's a tough spot then. Let's take a look at the rest of the second half here. Just a superior effort on the fake punt. Rich Miller will hit Todd Jessup for the second time, and probably shouldn't have had a first down, but through determination, he uh, took some tackles with him for the first down. I guarantee you one thing about this football team is that uh, they never stop fighting, and uh, we're going after it, and that effort, I think, is just kind of emblematic of, of the kind of uh, fight that we've had out of our guys. Rob Gluss still in at quarterback. He'll roll to the right, hit Damon Garner, a senior receiver out of Baltimore. He'll pick up 16, get most of it back. That was after a penalty, so now you're looking at a third and three and convert this one. All right. Uh, coming back once again after, you know, after things have happened, coming back, moving the ball a little bit. Tough break here. A huge gain to Mark Gentilly, but somebody got their hands in, able to knock the ball out. And 
Once again, the ball bouncing in favor of the green. Untimely, one of those untimelies again that you were talking about earlier. Dartmouth really only had one good drive of the day. It was this one, 14 plays, 85 yards, 737. Chewed up a whole lot of clock. Fiedler, I thought, on this uh, drive really made the most of it on the ground. He makes two outstanding runs, one of 12 and one of 18 on the scramble that uh, really are the big plays in this drive. Here's the scramble. Looked like he was ready to throw and all of a sudden decided to tuck it under and he seemed to do a nice job of getting people to miss. All right. He's got just a big enough piece. And then Ken Gordon will carry over one of about four or five running backs used in the game for Dartmouth. He shut down their run pretty well. I was not impressed with their running game. I think we played job. decently against the run. We still feel like we got a little... Oh, there's a little ground to cover there. Here, John Caldwell makes a good rush, makes a, a hit on the backside. Susa Boone picks it up, and uh, we get some quick points. And you're going to go for two here, and again, uh, good coverage by Dartmouth. Two-point conversion, tough play to convert, I think, uh, especially you know when you're down that close, especially in the air, I think. That's, that's why you get two points. <laughs> it, you know, it's a it's small piece of football field, and you're trying, if, particularly if you're trying to throw, you're, you're running receivers into a small area and then obviously the coverage can be real tight. One of the things you've had trouble with this season is time of possession. 33 minutes plus to 26 minutes. Defense has been on the field an average of about five minutes more per game. That makes it tough to win. Well, uh, our defense, I think one of the things that's good about our defense is that they're learning, uh, haven't had that experience mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that there is, a, there's kind of like an extra thing that they have to have. Uh, to make the difference in those kinds of situations. And, and they're kind of coming along with that. I, th I don't think they ever get to the point where they start to feel like, boy, we've been out here too long or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm real tired. And um, I think that we're going to work through that. And I also know that we're going to be able to possess the ball a little better. As Bucknell Football 93 continues, we'll talk with our special guests, cornerback Mark Miller and tight end Mark Gentilly after this two-minute timeout. Justin Frick now will kick off for the Bison. He will handle the kickoff duties instead of Miller this time. Chases White back to the 6, across the 10 to the 15, and at the 22-yard line, he is clotheslined by John Caldwell, Mr. Special Teams for the Bucknell Bison. Caldwell now with his fourth tackle, all on kickoffs this year. First and 10 for the Bison now. First time they've crossed into Dartmouth territory. The Bison will throw on first down. Cops swing pass left side to Bernardini. Catches at the 45, and there's the speed. He's going to go 20, 10, 5. Touchdown, Brad Bernardini. The track star who won the Patriot League championship at 55 meters indoors got just a little crack he needed on the little swing pass, and he took it off to the races. 43 yards for the score. Catch the action. Feel the excitement. Experience the thrill of Bucknell football as Coach Lou Maranzano leads the Bison down the field to victory and another season of football excellence. Don't miss out on any of the action. Call the Davis Gym Ticket Office now for ticket sales and information at 717-524-3301. That's 717-524-3301. Bucknell is ready to take on the Patriot League. Are you... Dartmouth starting with their weakest field position of the day. First and 10 from their own 23. Fiedler looking, now being chased out of the pocket. Flushed and throws it to Miller, who intercepts for Bucknell at the 30. His third interception of the year. He'll return it to the 23. And old momentum is now wearing blue and orange. With the third down and nine and a half to go for Dartmouth for a first down. Fiedler play fakes to Bajeri. John Caldwell knocks the ball out. And Cecil Boone, the defensive captain, will pick it up at the 15 and go in for the score. It was John Caldwell who comes in from the blind side, coming in as a defensive end. He's played a little bit of it the last couple of weeks, forcing the fumble, and Cecil Boone coming from the other defensive end, picks up the garbage and puts it in the can. Just some of the outstanding plays from Saturday. Joining us on our player segment, cornerback Mark Miller, tight end Mark Gentilly. Mark, a sophomore out of Florida, had a chance last year, Mark, to start some as a freshman. How was that coming up and right off the bat getting to be a starter in college football? Yeah, it was it was pretty exciting, you know. One of the starting corners last year went down in Blaine Fawcett, and that kind of gave me a chance to move up in there. And, you know, I got a lot of experience, which has really helped me out this year, you know. I'm a lot more confident, you know, my drops and my coverages. And it's a lot different from high school, you know. What's the biggest adjustment you, um, you move up from high school to college? Well, the talent, for one, you know, you're playing all the top receivers from high school, you know, they're all here now. It's not just, you know, every other week that you play a good receiver, but mainly the coverages, the zone coverages, the checks that you have to make, that you have to adjust to, the adjustments. So 
So it seems like it's a very complex position. You guys are always doing different things in the center. Yeah, there's a, we're always changing things up, you know. And at corner, it's really, it's, it's not as tough, you know, like Todd Jessup we have back there making all the checks. He does a great job. Makes it a lot easier for the corners and the rest of the secondary. Well, Mark, you had an adjustment last year as well. You went from quarterback to tight end of two fairly different positions. Uh, you've already caught as many passes this year as you did all last year. It sounds like the adjustment's gone pretty well. You know, last year I was, I was playing quarterback at the beginning of camp and didn't really see much light at the end of that tunnel. So I decided, you know, Coach O'Connor said something to me about switching to a receiver, so I switched to tight end. and It's gone pretty well. Um, still working hard on my blocking. Needs to improve. Lifted a lot in the summertime. And uh, you know, I'm just working to get better. Are you are you a lot bigger now? I mean, he I mean heavier, obviously not much taller. Yeah. But uh, end of last year, I weighed 203 pounds, and now I weigh 225 pounds. So I gained 20 pounds. Do they have to teach you the techniques of how to block? And if so, what kind of things did you do to to learn how to do it? Well, we just in practice we go, you know, we do technique drills, and and it, a lot of it's getting used to the contact which I got used to really fast in camp last year. And uh, uh, the coaches do a good job of teaching us techniques. So, you know, I feel, I feel comfortable, but I still need to get a little bit better. And obviously, as a receiver, you've been, you've been right off the bat. It seemed like that was something that came much easier. Yeah, I guess it just comes from playing a lot of backyard football. <laughs> Mark, we've got two Marks on the program. Mark Miller, uh, um, you came here from Florida. We've got quite a few Floridians on this Bucknell team. How did you find out about it? How did you decide to, to come up north to play college football? Well, I guess Coach Lou recruited me at my high school, and uh, I looked at the college, and, you know, it's a great engineering program, along with the good football, you know, 1AA football. So I really saw it as, you know, a good opportunity for me to get away from home, as well as, you know, play good football and get a great education. And seeing that I, you know, I wanted to go as an engineer, so I'm majoring in. This is a great engineering school, so... Just a great opportunity for me. When did you come up? Did you have snow on the ground when you came up on your recruiting trip? No, it wasn't snow. It was, I guess, rainy, but, you know, it wasn't snowing. But. Mark, uh, the team right now we've talked about has had some tough breaks, gotten behind early. What's, what's the mood of the team right now heading into the Hofstra game this week? Um, well, we think if we can win this one, we can beat Brown, then, you know, we'll have a lot of momentum going into Holy Cross. And... I think we just we feel unlucky and we feel very frustrated with the way things have gone. Because when I was a freshman, I, we didn't have that many good players, and it was like, oh, you know, we got blown out of that one, we got blown out of that one. But it's like you think back to these games and you're like, gee, if we only would have just done that one thing right, if we would have done that one thing right, we'd be right in this game. So the team's very frustrated, but I, I think I think we're gonna make it through. And Mark, this week as we finish up the interview, Hopsher has got a whole new set to run and shoot. Does that make it more difficult for somebody like you playing corner? It, it puts a lot more pressure on the defensive backs, of course. You know, we're going to run, like Coach said, a lot of nickel, put a little bit more speed back there, and uh, hope we can shut down their option. They run a lot of option, and then hopefully make some plays on the defensive side of the ball that can turn the game around. Tough to adjust from one team to another. It seems like each week they give you a little, every team gives you something a little different to look at. Yeah, well, at least this week we don't have to put up with Jay Fielder. Like, <laughs> he's a great quarterback, but uh, Hofstra has a very shifty quarterback, he can run the ball, he can throw the ball, and they got some good receivers, they run some good patterns. They're a good team, they have a good offense. Style of defense, make any difference for you, Mark? Did mm -hmm. you play against? Are they more react to you? It's supposed to, but <laughs> coaches will tell me it's supposed to, and I, I don't really know that much about the defenses. I mean, they talk about cover seven, cover three, cover two, and stuff. I just run my pattern. <laughs> just go out there and catch the ball. Well, Mark yeah. Gentilly, Mark Miller, thanks a lot for being with us. Best of luck against Hofstra this week. Thanks. I'll be back with Coach Lou Maranzana as Bucknell Football 93 continues after this timeout. Since 1846, scholars have come together at Bucknell to ask questions and explore answers. Inspired by the fresh spirit of the newest students and the seasoned wisdom of the faculty, this meeting of minds fosters achievement. Bucknell professors enjoy national reputation, and Bucknell students are known for their intelligence. Their lively exchanges extend from classrooms and seminars to informal meetings in faculty offices and the campus snack bar. Bucknell is a comfortable place for the tradition of the classics and the demands of today's society. The arts, humanities, and sciences thrive alongside professional programs in engineering, education, management, and music. The environment for this growing diversity and the ongoing meeting of minds is a very beautiful campus in central Pennsylvania. Bucknell's stately buildings and beautiful trees and gardens provide an ideal collegiate setting. 
Bucknell with 3,300 undergraduates and over 260 faculty members who sustain the spirit that is this university and who carry it with them throughout their lives. At Bucknell, the balance between academics and athletics is accomplished as well as it is any place in the country. In fact, recent NCAA statistics show that for the second consecutive year, the Bison led the country in the graduation rate of their student athletes. Many factors contribute to this. The student athletes themselves, their coaches, their professors, and the administrators here, as well as the support of Bison fans. Another factor contributing to the overall athletic success at Bucknell is the work of the Bison Club, a group of interested persons whose support enhances all 26 men's and women's varsity sports here at Bucknell. Membership to the Bison Club is open to all followers of the Bison, not just Bucknell alumni. We would invite you to join the Bison Club today and receive the Bison Roundup newsletter and stay up to date on all activities of Bucknell Athletics. For more information, write to the Bison Club in care of Bucknell University or call 717-524-1358. Bison travel to Long Island on the turf against the Hofstra Flying Dutchman. We know they have the run and shoot. Uh, that always presents problems. They're pretty good. Right now they're two and three. They've won some, they've lost some. Yeah, they've, uh, you know, they're putting offense, uh, obviously throwing the ball over the place. The turf suits them. They like that running around out there at home particularly. Doing some things on offense that are a little different than running the ball. They run some, uh, you know, true option, and uh, which are, can be pretty tough. And uh, our, our thing has got to be, you know, to, to be consistent on offense and not just to possess the ball but to make points and uh, we'll fight it out with their with their offense as well with our defense. We've played in very competitive games for the most part in the past and we look for another good game uh, on Saturday with the Hofstra Dutchman. We're looking forward to it. Coach Maranzana, thanks for being with us. Best of luck against Hofstra. Thank you, Bob. For Lou Maranzana and our special guest today, Mark Gentilly and Mark Miller, this is Bob Beeler speaking. Thanks for watching.